two witnesses and two woes. Whoa, whoa. We'll find out who they are next. All right, Revelation chapter 11. We're coming back into John's revelation of Jesus Christ. And we're the heading above your, your Bible more than likely is going to say the two witnesses. Um, a couple of things happen before we get to those two guys, so I want to make sure and hit those things. Revelation 11, uh, and I'm in the ESV, English Standard. It says, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave it out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Um, so we stop right here. This Bible, I love this Bible. Um, unfortunately, the commentary in this Bible is pretty terrible when it comes to this. It says that the that the the temple here is indicative of the church, and that it's the church is is what John is talking about. Uh, th that's not true. Um, Revelation. If you continue to go, you're going to see Satan thrown down to earth, the woman and the dragon, the lamb. Uh, you are setting up for the desolation, uh, the, uh, sorry, the abomination of desolation, which is when the false prophet, the Antichrist, they come in and they sit in the temple. They enthrone themselves in the temple. We know that the temple has to be rebuilt this third time. This, I think, is what John is given the rod and the staff, and he's like, you go down and rise and measure the temple, measure this third temple. There's this go down, right, and measure those things that are there. Um, but don't measure this outer courtyard because it's been given over to the Gentiles. Um, that's a really interesting thing there. And, and I think when we look at this, the site where the temple would be built now, um, there's there's frustration and there's fighting and there's all these issues there because the Jews say that they control, um, Muslims say that they control, and there's this constant push. And right now, that site is under Muslim control. It's where the Dome of the Rock uh, sits, is, which is one of their most holy sites. Um, so it will be interesting. It will be interesting during this time, during the beginning of this tribulation, if the Antichrist and the prophet, if, if, if all of these things have started happening to where he has made peace with the, the Jews that are there, with the Muslims that are there, and they are now allowed to rebuild the temple section, the Holy and the Holy of Holies, while the Dome of the Rock still sits on the outside, and there is this weird hybrid temple which would already be an abomination to God. But then when the Antichrist comes in, he sits and takes his this place of like prominence and declares himself uh, to be God. I mean, and he and he's gonna sit down and he's gonna have this this clout where it is, you know, look at what I've done, look at what I've accomplished. There's now peace between these religions, there's peace between the world here. Um, and it says that they trampled on it for 42 months. Now that's three and a half years. Um, there is a seven-year period here where it is. there are blocks, um, three and a half years to three and a half years. The first three and a half years is this rule and this reign of the Antichrist. The second three and a half will be this, this, this upheaval, and, and we'll, we'll get there when we get there, but... As we look at this, it says they will trample my holy city for 42 months. So for three and a half years, the temple will stand. And there will be this, this hybrid abomination to God. And at that time, I will grant authority to two of my witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now... 1,260 days, guess how far that is, guess how long that is, 42 months, it's three and a half years, it's just kind of a different way, there's an exact numbered day of saying that, because um, it's not quite the three and a half, 
Um, but they will go through 99% of that three and a half years. And it says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out of their mouth and consumes their foes. So who are the two witnesses? Who are these two people? Again, my Bible here does a really terrible job where it, it talks about this being some symbolic something or other. Guys, I don't, I don't think there's any symbolism here. Um, I think there are two men who are placed on the earth and they begin to prophesy. They begin to share the gospel. And you have to remember, at this point, the church has been raptured out. There are those saved saints who have come out of this tribulation. There are people who have accepted Christ during this. But the vast majority of the world at this point is following, is, is just blindly following themselves, following the Antichrist. I mean, this is a dark, dark moment for the world. That's why this is the second woe. And these two men show up on scene and they stand in Jerusalem and they begin to prophesy and to share the gospel. And they do this for like three and a half years. They will stand there and they will preach and they will preach and they will preach. Now, um, tradition and I think a lot of biblical common sense says that these two men will be Moses and Elijah. I could make I could make a case to say it is Elijah and a man named Enoch because Elijah and Enoch in the Bible were the only two people never to die. Elijah gets taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. It says that Enoch walked with God and one day was not. It never records a death for him. Literally, he just got taken up. So because these two men have never experienced that earthly death, I could make that point for them. A lot of people lean to this being Moses and Elijah. I have no issue with that. I have no issue with it either way. Uh, honestly, I don't know 100% sure. But I can tell you why I think Moses and Elijah. Let's look at this. If anybody would harm them, fire pours out of their mouth and consumes their foes. And if anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying and they have power over the water to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. The reason I think it's Moses and Elijah is there in verse 6, nestled in there. Elijah, one of his great miracles was that he commanded it not to rain and that it didn't rain. And then at his word, the rain came back. At his word and his prayer to the Lord, the rain returned. Moses, if you remember from Exodus, Moses comes in and there are a slew of plagues that he puts, that God puts on Pharaoh through Moses. One of those, the water being turned to blood. And so these miracles, these plagues, being named specifically, I think, is just a little indicator there to help us understand that. Now, again, I may be way off. It may be Billy Bob and Tim, you know, and, and it's just two different guys. But I think it's a beautiful thing as we understand that God works in patterns and God reveals himself in these patterns and these, in these cyclical rhythms and revelations um, that you have here Moses who is the, the standard of the law. You have Elijah, who is kind of the standard of the prophets, and soon to be the return of Jesus Christ, who is the standard of the church age, the standard of grace. It seems to me that that would be a very logical, very, very stair step and very easy walk out on that. Plus, you have to remember, who are the two that sat with Jesus in his transfigured state uh, in the Gospels? That was Moses and that was Elijah. So, obviously, some clout there. I do want to talk about this for just a second. If anybody would harm them, in verse 5, fire pours out of their mouth and consumes their foes. Because I used to think, man, that should be an obvious thing to like make you accept Jesus. If there's two men standing in Jerusalem and they're preaching, and all of a sudden somebody comes up and talks against them, and they open their mouth and fire comes out like a dragon and just consumes this person, right? That would make me go, yeah, okay, obviously these guys are probably something. Um, 
years of study and looking at that, I don't, I don't think that's kind of what that means. When it says fire comes out of their mouths, I don't know that it means literally fire out of their mouths like a dragon. I think more uh, when people come and they ridicule them, there is this prayer to God and God supplies this fire, which would cause people not really to bat an eye because you have to remember at this point, there have already been these seals opened and there have already been these trumpets blown in which fire has come down and just eradicated mankind. And so people could pass this off. They could dismiss this and say, well, it's just this continuation of this meteor shower and this person just happened to be there. And that's how Satan's going to work and get behind this and, and, and try, to, try to dismantle what these two guys are doing. But they have this power to hit mankind with plagues as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony... The beast that rises from the bottomless pit. Remember, if we go back just a little bit, Satan was given the key. He opens the key to the shaft of the abyss. These demons, they rise up. And that, that beast that rises up, which I think personally would, would be Satan because it says beast singular. Um, he will make war on them and will conquer them and will kill them. And their bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Okay, so we have to read this in portions. Where was, God, where was Jesus crucified? Right outside of Jerusalem. So that's the city that we're talking about. But John gives some great indications here as to what's going on during these three and a half years. He calls it the great city. The great city is not a reference to the great city of Jerusalem. It's actually a, the great city of Babylon. Babylon was known as the great city. And so John is looking and he's saying Jerusalem has now turned into Babylon. It's now turned into Sodom. It's now turned into Egypt. It is steeped in idolatry. It is steeped in paganism. It is steeped in all of these issues and all of these things that are turning people away from God. How far Jerusalem has fallen, how far it has come from being the place where Jesus did ministry, from being the place where Christianity was birthed to now the place where this abomination sits. And he looks and he says, for three and a half days after their death, people from every tribe and language and nation will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in the tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Now you think about this. You think about this. People are going to basically have a whole nother Christmas because they think that what they have done in this death, that these two people dying, because they have brought on these plagues. You have to understand how Satan is working this, man. You're looking at this and, you know, Satan and, and, the, and the, you know, he seems to be bringing peace. He seems to be bringing, you know, the, the nations together. He seems to be bringing, you know, food sources and all of these things while these things are, are scarce. He seems to be working all these great things. And then all of a sudden these prophets of God show up and they begin to hit people with plagues after plagues after plagues tormenting the earth and and it's so easy for satan to go look look see you see what they're doing you see do you see do you see how terrible they are and so when these men die the whole earth rejoices so much that we go buy each other presents and we hand gifts to each other and we celebrate their death and every tribe and nation and language is able to see these men as they lay there dead in the streets for three and a half days refuse to be buried and i used to talk about this and it's only getting more and more true you know back as a youth pastor in the late 90s early 2000s i was like well you know we have satellites that if they wanted to they could broadcast this yada 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 and man i look at this now and i'm like man with facebook with instagram with snapchat with youtube like these two men could literally be seen in seconds by the entire earth because you have to remember a third of the earth has already gone and portions of it have have, have died away there, there's not a whole ton of people left and they're going to share this video it's going to go viral they're going to see these things they're going to rejoice in it but after the three and a half days a breath of life 
from God entered them. And they stood up on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw them. And then they heard a loud voice come from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to God, to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third is soon to come. I, uh, I want to take a break here. I want to stop here because I want to hit the seventh trumpet and the woman and the dragon next week. But um, I, need, I need you to understand kind of what we've done here in Revelation. We've done like a weird little shift. And a lot of people would say, a lot of commentator, commentators will say, this is John writing backwards looking at what has happened in Rome with the earthquake, looking at what has happened when Rome um, took control of, of, of the temple. I don't, I don't think that's true. He's writing in a past tense. I saw these things happen. It fell, not it will fall. So he's writing in this past tense. So I really think here, when, when in chapter 10, when he eats this little scroll and he's given this full breadth and width and knowledge of what is happening. In chapter 11, there's this weird shift back because if you go into 12 and 13, we're going to start talking about a woman and a dragon. This is not a literal woman who is chased by a literal dragon. We're going to talk about the church. We're going to talk about Christ. We're going to talk about the fall of Satan. We're going to talk about all of these things, Satan being thrown down. So I think if you if you understand that in 11, there is this 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 weird like recap of all these things that have happened that he starts here with the two witnesses and then he's going to go in at 12 and he's going to draw you back in and help you understand everything leading up to this um, everything leading up to the beast the second beast the bowls of wrath and once we hit those bowls it's not like the trumpets there's not like these long expanses of years it's literally at the midpoint of this three and a half year, or at the midpoint of this years, this three and a half, these things ramp up very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. In fact, if you do cheat and look down at Revelation eleven fifteen, the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Why are they celebrating? Why are they celebrating? There, has, there hasn't even been the battle yet. There hasn't even been anything. Like, why would they celebrate? We've still got all this revelation left to go. That's because a bunch of this revelation is a recap up. It's a, it's a bringing back up to speed. And then when we hit, Jesus literally wastes no time in this. This is the beginning of of all of heaven understanding, the battle's over. That second woe has passed, and now we are in quick step, in quick motion, to see Jesus Christ overtake and remake the world. And that's that's an amazing thing. Um, the amazing thing, again, for us, if you're here and you're watching this and you already know Christ is your Savior, the amazing thing for us is I want you to read Revelation chapter 1 through 4. I want you to really, really, really focus on those because the churches, the letters to the churches help us to understand what kind of church we should be. And then we read 4 and we understand a rapture and a great multitude. And then I want you to skip and I want you to go ahead to chapter 19 where Christ is one and he is victorious and we are with him and he is remaking everything and he is making all things new and there is nothing but celebration. Because if you are in Christ, if you are saved in Christ, guys, the beautiful thing about this is it doesn't it pertain to you. None of this, none of these trumpets, none of these bowls are poured out on you. There is no condemnation for you who are in Christ. You are saved through this. You are saved from this. And you were saved by Jesus Christ. So, quick word of encouragement there at the end. Let me pray with you. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you for who you are and for what you do. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your kindness. Father, we thank you that you have spared us from 
these horrors, these, these, these things that we see coming about on the earth. And Father, I just pray, Lord Jesus, that You would be merciful to those that You desire to show mercy. Father, I pray that You would just be gracious while there's still time to be gracious. Father, we love You. We thank You. We praise You for saving us and for all that You do. And it's in Your mighty name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen.